Well, good morning and welcome. We are so glad you have joined us. How are you doing? If you are like us, you are ready for things to return to normal. Unfortunately, this pandemic is not cooperating so much. So in an effort to strengthen community and unity within the body, the pastoral staff, together with the Board of Elders and ministry leaders, have begun to make plans for the next several months. The primary focus will be on a church-wide initiative of discipleship. And what better way to begin than at the Firm Foundation? Which leads us to our highlighted event for this week, Alpha Online. As many of you know, Alpha is an effective tool for introducing seekers to Jesus. But did you also know that it's a great discipleship tool that helps us grow in our own journey of faith? It will help remind us in a fresh way of what we believe and why we believe it. Who knows? We may even learn something new. Also, it will equip and strengthen us for the answers of the questions of today's culture. It is our hope that all people who call Surrey Alliance home will register for this 11-week life-changing program. And please make sure to invite your friends, your family, your neighbors, your co-workers, and anybody else you can find. We will be providing you with invitations, both paper and digital, that you may use to invite others. The registration deadline is September 16th, and the start date is Wednesday, September 23rd. Also coming, September 13th is our fall kickoff. It will be a great way to start off this next season. Stay tuned for the SAC newsletter that will be outlining all the events will be happening over the next several months. Please pray with me. Lord God, we thank you for this beautiful day. Lord, because you have made it. Doesn't matter what the weather is, your light is with us at all times. And Father, we just pray that you would uh, be with each one of us as we worship you in song, in thought, in prayer, in giving, and that uh, we would be open and responsive to what your servant has to say to us today through the sermon. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning, Surrey Alliance Church. It is so good to be with you. My name is Dwayne Taves. I'm one of the assistant district superintendents. And what a privilege it is for me to be here. Um, thank you to Mike and Byron for just giving me the privilege of leading you in worship this morning. And I don't know where you're at. I don't know where you're watching from, whether it's on your, your mobile device from some vacation spot this summer, whether it's you know, in your home with, with a, a group of friends where you're, where you're just dialing in. But I, I pray that God would meet you in a powerful way. That the songs that we sing, although online, although with a reduced amount of people around us, would give praise and adoration to the King of Kings. He is with us. Let our praises rise as incense to Him this morning. Feet 
darkness shaking All the dead are coming back to life I'm back to life Hear the song awaken All creation singing We're alive Cause you're alive You call me out of the grave You call me into the light You call my name and then my heart came alive your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. And what a love we found, death can't hold us down, we shout it out, we Cause you're alive and what a love we found Death can't hold us down We shout it out, we're alive Cause you're alive and what a love we found Death can't hold us down We shout it out, we're alive Cause you're alive Your love is great your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger. Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still. When striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand.
Christ in me from life's first cry to final breath Jesus commands my destiny no power of hell no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home here in the power of Christ I stand oh, 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 or calls me home here in the power of Christ I stand here in the power of Christ I stand Thanks for joining us online and a special welcome to those of you joining me uh, live in person. We are going through the Psalms this summer and there's something about the Psalms that is so attractive, almost magnetic. They draw us in, don't they? I wonder if it's because of the raw emotion, the brutal honesty that we all feel, but at times are afraid to express because as Christians we're to be anchored and stable in our emotions God is in control and will work things out so don't worry be happy it's what we tell ourselves and yet with the Psalms there is a wild west type of feel there's this current of unbridled emotion where the writers actually express complaints Despair, doubt, and anger towards God and their circumstances. One of the first things that I learned when I interned way back in 1995 at First Alliance Church in Calgary is that it's okay to be angry with God. I'll never forget it. We were getting ready to have church one Sunday morning. A lady walked in off the street and she was very, very angry. So my supervisor, who had been a pastor for a long time, went to talk to her. And after he was finished, I said, well, how did that go? And he said, well, the lady's not having a good day. She's really, really angry at God. And I told her that it's okay to be angry at God. And I was like, wow. This, 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 is, this is really new to me. You mean anger at God is something that we can express to him? 
we can be that honest with God and, and He won't get mad at us. He won't smite us with His big finger. It's like, wow, I'd never heard of this before. This is going to be some type of internship. The truth is that God wants us to be honest with Him. He welcomes an authentic relationship. Because listen for a minute, if we are going through the motions praying these cute, tidy little prayers as Christians because that's what Christians do. And yet if our heart is disengaged and full of all sorts of emotion, don't you think that God's going to know that we're faking it? And this is why there are so many psalms of lament. By the way, for all of you Bible trivia people out there, 40% of the psalms are laments directed at God. There are people who are angry, who are complaining, who are almost shaking their fist at God. Listen to part of Psalm 6. This would make a great sermon. I am worn out from my groaning. All night long I flood my bed with weeping and drench my couch with tears. Or take Psalm 88. The last words of this psalm. By the way, I'm going to speak on this next Sunday. But here's the very last words of this psalm. Darkness is my closest friend. Wow. Very, very real. Very, very authentic. Because we really want the happy endings, don't we? We, we, we want life to be like what happens in the movies. You, you know how it is, right? We finish our popcorn with, with extra butter and a large Coke. It has to be extra butter and real butter, right? And we leave after we've watched the movie, with warm, warm fuzzies. We're all happy, happy, happy. And, and this is the way it is in the movies. And we so want life to be like this, don't we? God just fix everything. Amen. And it doesn't work. They all lived happily ever after is a fairy tale. Question for you. Have you ever cried yourself to sleep? Have you ever felt utterly and bitterly alone? Have you ever thought this is hopeless? Have you ever said to yourself, well, this, this isn't fair. Why have I been dealt these cards? And God, where are you? To use the words of Psalm 88, have you ever felt like darkness is your closest friend? And I think this is why the Psalms have been the go-to for God's people for, for so, so long. As it's been said by someone, they, they said this, in the book of Psalms, the tempted and the tested gained strength from the pilgrims of yesterday whose feet have bled along the same thorny pathway. This is why when, when the pandemic hit, uh, there was a go-to kind of a movement for people to read Psalm 91. And we're going to do it for 91 days. And so a lot of people uh, turn to Psalm 91, which, which is a good idea, good thing, a good plan. Because again, the Psalms, they bring comfort. They offer hope. And they help us to realize that we are not alone. We now come to our Psalm for today. I, I just had to get that off my chest. I feel so much better now. Thank you. Psalm 46, a very well-known psalm, a go-to for many people. So if you have your Bible, turn there, uh, Psalm 46. Don't mind me, I'm just sweating like crazy up here. All right. Notice what the title says, for the director of music. Now, psalm means song. So the Israelites would gather, they would sing these psalms, these songs, as part of their corporate worship. Kind of like how you have your worship playlist on Apple Music. You know, you have your list, your favorite list of worship songs, and you sing away. Well, this was their list, all 150 psalms. It also says, of the sons of Korah. Now we know from 2 Chronicles 20, that the sons of Korah were Levites who assisted in temple worship. So just a little bit of background. Now, I also found out that this was Martin Luther's favorite psalm. This was his go-to. You guys remember that, that hymn, of, co of course you do, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Well, he wrote that hymn 
based on this psalm. And so let's jump into this. Calling this talk, Trusting God in Troubled Times. So look at verse 1. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in times of trouble. Let's just stop for a minute. Isn't that good news? Take that in for a minute. I want you to let that land. Let this hit your heart. Let me read it again. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in times of trouble. A lot of psalms begin with the problem. They begin with the crisis. Uh, not this psalm. He, he begins with God. He sets his eyes on God. God is, is refuge, strength, ever-present help in times of trouble. This is how he starts. He's zeroing in on, on God. Now, can I just stop for a minute? There's lots of trouble these days, isn't there? We find ourselves in a global pandemic. There's fear and uncertainty. People have lost their jobs. There's racism, riots, unrest, dictators, military posturing. You, you get the sense that the world is this ticking time bomb. There's, there's so much trouble on the macro world scale. Um, I don't know if you've noticed this, but CBC News on their website now, every day has a little segment that says some good news from the world. And that's a good thing because there's all this bad news, all this trouble, not much good news. That's on the macro level, but on the personal, individual level, we all know trouble. Trouble will come. Not if, but when. Jesus actually promised us this. Uh, it's not a promise that I'm going to highlight in my Bible, but Jesus said so matter-of-factly, in this world you will have trouble. So, we live in a troubled world, and because of this, troubled times will come. Are you in trouble right now? The psalmist goes on to describe this trouble. Look at verse 2. So we will not fear when earthquakes come and the mountains crumble into the sea. Let the oceans roar and foam. Let the mountains tremble as the waters surge. Now, I want you to notice the, the depth of this trouble. Earthquakes, mountains falling into the sea, violent storms. You, you get the picture, right? The writer is using hyperbole. He is exaggerating the worst of the worst of the worst. As if to say to us, when the worst trouble comes for you, when your life is violently shaking, when it's not going well, when there's chaos and uncertainty, when a global pandemic hits and so on, you fill in the blank. Notice what he says at the beginning of all of this trouble, all this chaos. If only we could live this way. Because what does he say? We will not fear. Oh, man, wouldn't that be nice? God, God, help us. May this be so. God, when all of this is happening, we will not fear. Again, wouldn't that be nice? How can this even be possible? <laughs> How can this be possible? Because I want that. And I know that you want that too. So what does the psalmist do? He, he points us to God. He tells us three things about God that are part of his character. How God is, is unchanging in changing times. Uh, the theological word is immutable. Now way back in November of 1999, I, I got ordained. And, and I actually remember this word immutable. Don't ask me how I remember that, but I do for some reason now, ordination was fun, by the way. I don't know if fun's the right word, but I'll use it. It was fun. You go in front of a panel for about three hours, and they can ask you any question about God and the Bible and life and ethics and morality, which is no problem because you have the Bible and God mastered. So bring it on. Yeah, right. That's what I thought back then, actually. Young, foolish me. I did pass, though. Anyway, where was I? 
Oh yeah, immutable. Here's what it means. Unchanging over time. Unable to change. And so God is immutable. He, he cannot change. He's the same yesterday, same today, and same forever. And so the psalmist begins by pointing us to our unchanging God. And he says there's no reason to fear. Why not? Because God is our refuge. He's our strength. He's an ever-present help. In times of trouble. So let's take a minute to break this down. Yes, I'm sweating like crazy up here. First, God is our refuge. What comes to your mind when you hear this word? God is our refuge. What picture do you see? What image floods your, your mind? What do you think of? Maybe it's a thick-walled fortress of some kind. Maybe it's some type of protection in a storm. You know, like those paintings that we've all seen where there's, where there's that, that, that lighthouse that is getting you know, buffeted with the waves and the wind, but, it, but it's standing strong and, and you're safe and, and you're secure. Maybe you think of a lighthouse like that or, or just something that makes you feel safe. In the Old Testament, they had cities of refuge. You can read about these in the book of Numbers. So, let's say you are chopping wood in your yard one day when the head of the axe flies off, hitting your neighbor in the head, killing him. Not a good day. Bad, bad, bad. Since this was unintentional, you could flee to a city of refuge and find safety. And this is the picture that we have of God when it comes to him being our refuge. The idea here is that God provides safety, security, protection. Now, the pushback is, okay, God is our refuge. Then why didn't he protect me from that? Why didn't he protect me from this? And, and I can't answer that. What I can say is that I wonder if one day you're going to go before God, you're going to see God, and you're going to see him face to face, and I wonder if he's going to say to you, I was with you your whole life. I never abandoned you, and I spared you from certain things. I protected you from this, and 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 you're going to hear it, and you're going to be like, whoa, I didn't know it. And that's right. God's going to say, you didn't know it because it never happened. Now, the only way that something can happen to us is if in the mystery of God's sovereignty, he, he allows it. Our job is to trust him, to turn to him when we are in crisis. And in many ways, David was the poster boy for this. I don't know if you know his story. It was quite a wild story because at different points in his life, David was on the run from people who wanted to kill him. Um, he actually spent, check this out, 10 years of his life hiding in caves. Julie and I have been to Israel. We've been in these caves. I can promise you it, it's not the Hilton. And so here David would spend 10 years of his life hiding in caves, hiding from people who, who wanted to kill him. And yet what would David say? Listen to Psalm 62. It's, it's amazing. He says, God is my mighty rock, my refuge. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. You see, with David, the road wasn't an easy one. Far from it. But he poured out his heart to God time after time after time, and he trusted God regardless of what was going on in his life regardless of, of his circumstances. And he found safety and security knowing that God was with him, that God had the final say in his life, that no people, no circumstances could happen unless God somehow allowed it. So not people, not circumstances. David found his safety in God as his refuge. And this is what it means. When crisis and trouble hits, 
we go to God and we ask Him for help and protection and we trust Him, knowing that He is with us and is in control, that nothing can happen to us that God doesn't first allow. Now when it comes to your life, God will never say, whoops, that took me by surprise. I wasn't expecting that to happen to them. And so we're going to call a heavenly meeting. Quick, everybody get here. And, and let's have a discussion. What should we do? Of course not. No, God is our refuge, our strength, and ever-present help in times of trouble. He provides safety, security, and protection. And I love what Greg Laurie says about this. He says, essentially, the Christian is indestructible. In other words, nothing can happen to a Christian that God doesn't allow that God doesn't first filter through his sovereignty. If something has happened, God has allowed it, and he can bring good out of it. What the enemy intended for evil, God intends for good. I don't know if you've heard the song, See a Victory. It's one of my favorite songs right now. Have you heard it? Anybody heard it? A few? Love the chorus. You take what the enemy intended for evil, you turn it for good. No, I'm not going to sing it. That's it. It's all you get. If you read Joseph's life in the book of Genesis, it's quite the story, isn't it? Uh, here's a Reader's Digest version. Joseph is sold into slavery by his brothers. And from that point on, things get crazy. He's in prison. It seems though God forgets about him. It's a crazy, crazy story because here's a guy who continues to do the right thing over and over and over again. And, and we have our formulas, don't we? It's like if I do the right thing, then God has to bless me. And yet here's a guy who lived as God asked him to, and yet the bottom of his life continued to fall out from under him. He did the right thing, and things got worse. And yet as the story progresses, God is at work. And then after it ends, 22 years after the fact, he's reconciled with his brothers, and we see God working through his life. And God took all these things, and he used it for good. Now, where this gets really challenging is when the day of trouble comes, when the day of trouble actually lands on our front doorstep. Again, we're calling this psalm Trusting God in Troubled Times because there's two things that usually happen with trouble, two responses to trouble. Which is why it's been said trouble is, is like the sun. It can harden you like clay or it can melt you like wax. So let's talk about this for a minute. How do you respond when you're going through trouble? Everybody's laughing at me. I'm just sweating so much up here. Oh well. How do you respond when you go through trouble. There was a time in my life, quite a few years ago, when my heart became heart hard like clay. We've told you this before, but the context of this was Julie's health and all of the chronic pain that was part of her life. We would pray for breakthrough, for healing, for health, for energy, for anything, just something. God, show up. God, give the doctors wisdom. Is, is, is there a new medication that she could go on? And we would pour, pour out our hearts to God. God seems so silent, so distant. And so one day at a, at a pastor's conference, we had the president of the denomination pray for her beca uh, because he's, he's a guy who, it, it's, God just uses him. And so he'll pray for people who need healing and God will show up and heal them. So, okay, we're going to have him pray for Julie. It's a guaranteed thing. He prays for her, nothing. This went on for years. God seems so silent, so distant, almost disengaged, uninterested. And my heart, heart became hard, like clay. And for a time, I, I stopped praying, which is quite interesting. A pastor stopped praying. It's true. I threw in the towel. Thought prayer doesn't work. It doesn't matter. 
doesn't make a difference. Have you ever been in a place like this where you're face to face with something, you're going through this trouble that you didn't ask for, you would have never signed up for it, and yet here it is, and you're crying out to God and just nothing, and, and you give up, and your heart becomes hard like clay. That was me for a time. There's another way that you can deal with trouble. It can melt you like wax. It can cause your heart to be soft so that you cry out to God. And I think this is what it means to make God our refuge. God, things are so tough right now. I don't know how I'm going to get through this. But I turn to you. I trust you. I know that you are with me. And this is the point of the psalm. It's about God's presence through really, really difficult times. The end of verse 1, an ever-present help in times of trouble. Right in the middle of verse 7, it says, the Lord Almighty is with us. And then the very end, it says it again, the Lord Almighty is with us. And so the beginning of the psalm, the middle, and, and the end. He, he is an ever-present help. He is with us. He is with us. That's, that's the psalm. That's what... He, that's, that's the message. Now, we're not 100% sure of the context of this psalm. Most scholars would believe that the probable context is when the Assyrian army surrounded Jerusalem during the reign of Hezekiah. You can read about this in 2 Kings chapter 18 and chapter 19. It's quite a wild story. Here's the Reader's Digest version. Hezekiah was, was a good king who trusted in the Lord. He removed the high places that were set up for all of the idol worship, and, and he kept God's commands. He obeyed God. And because of this, the Lord blessed him and was with him. However, on one occasion, things took a turn for the worse. You could say that the day of trouble arrived for Hezekiah. For one day, the commander of the Assyrian army surrounded the walls of Jerusalem, calling on the people to surrender to the great king of Assyria. And the message was, our gods are greater. You have no chance, so surrender and do it now. And this was the logic, and it was logic that was really hard to argue against because up until now, the Syrian army had been on a rampage, defeating nation after nation after nation after nation. And now here they are, surrounding Jerusalem, threatening to do the same thing to Hezekiah and to the people of God. Hezekiah gets word of this, goes into the temple and prays to God and God answers him through the prophet Isaiah who tells him that God will protect the city. And that very night, an angel went through the Assyrian camp killing 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. This is the probable context of this psalm. And this is why they could proclaim with such confidence, our God is an ever-present help in times of trouble. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice. The earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. And then again, at the end, the Lord Almighty is with us. This is what this psalm is saying to us. When, when you are in trouble, Big trouble. Now, I'm speaking metaphorically for a minute. When the Assyrian army has you surrounded, when you are trapped in Jerusalem like a bird in a cage with no place to go and no one to turn to, when things in your life seem so, so dark and so hopeless, when it seems as if the earth is giving way, when the mountains fall into the sea, when the waters roar, when, when there's violent storms and a cosmic shaking going on, we will not fear. Why? God is our refuge, our strength, and ever-present help in times of trouble. The Lord Almighty is with us. The Lord Almighty is with us. This is what this psalm is saying to us. Now, what's the message of Christmas? If I was to say to you, okay, what's the message of Christmas? You, you've got three words. 
Well, God with us. That's the message of Christmas. Break it down into one word. It's Emmanuel, which means, again, God with us. And we talk about Emmanuel, God with us at Christmas, and then we kind of forget about it till the next Christmas. And yet the message of the Bible from start to finish is that God is with his people. He is Emmanuel, God with us. And I want you to notice, according to the psalm, just how close God is to us. What does it say? He is an ever-present help. In other words, he's near. He's really close by. And he's available for you. He's not removed and distant. He isn't busy helping other people around the world. Therefore, he cannot help you in your world. No. Even more, as New Testament people, God, through his spirit, now resides in each one of us as his people. And, and maybe you would push back and say, well, he doesn't with me. Because if, if only you knew the, the week that I had and, and all the sin that I struggle with, God's got a B team and a C team and a D team, and I'm on it. And I'd say, no, you're not. You're not on it. If you have Jesus, you have the Spirit, which means God lives in you. You can't get any closer. Do you understand that? I want you to hear that. Well, well, I don't feel God. So? So what? There's lots of times that I don't feel God. But what's the truth? What's the truth of Scripture? What are the facts? This is how close God is to you. Listen to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Do you not know that your bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit? Who's in you? Where is he? He's in you. You can't get any closer. He's nearby. He's, he's in you. Now, I don't know how your life is going right now. This is the problem with COVID. We haven't seen each other. We've lost touch in a lot of ways. And this is what I really dislike about this pandemic. We, we lose touch. We get disconnected. But maybe you would say, this is a timely psalm. Because I am right in the middle of a lot of stuff right now. I'm right in the thick of it. And there's lots of trouble in my life right now. And I don't know the way forward. I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know how I'm going to get out of this. And so this is really timely for me. Now, of course, I cannot promise you that everything will be okay by tomorrow can't promise that but would you be willing to say god in spite of everything that i'm going through in spite of everything that is going on i know i know that i know that i know that i know that you've not abandoned me that you're with me that whatever the outcome we'll go through this together and that'll be enough for me so i trust you I acknowledge your presence. I praise you in this storm, in this day of trouble. Would you be willing to say that? Let's finish this off. Verse 8, come and see what the Lord has done. The desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. The point to all this is that God is sovereign. He rules over all. No man, no one, no person, not the nations, not any nation is over him. He is the Lord Almighty. This is what these verses are saying to us. So be still and know that I am God. 
This does not mean silence and contemplation, even though it's good to do that at least once a year. That's a joke, by the way. There are times for silence and contemplation. It means surrender to me. Acknowledge that I am God and that there's no one who is like me, that I'm in control of the world and in control of your life. Because again, this is what the psalm is teaching, that he is the Lord. He is our refuge. He is the Lord Almighty, and he is with us. This is the message of this psalm. And this is why we can trust God in troubled times. God is with us. God is with us. God is with us. He will not ever abandon us. So whatever comes our way, we'll get through it. And we'll get through it with God right by our side. Let's pray. And I guess I would want to say to you today, if you're going through trouble, would you be able, would you be willing to just release that to the Lord today? Would you be able to say, God, I'm going through a lot of stuff right now. A lot of trouble. And I give it to you. Thank you that you are with me. I choose to trust you. I choose to believe that you are walking with me today and that you'll be with me tomorrow and each and every day. So God, help us to not fear during these difficult times. Help us to look to you. It's our refuge, our place of safety and security. As our strength, give us strength. And God, we thank you that you are an ever-present help in times of trouble. So help us to focus in on you during this pandemic, one day at a time. And we trust you. In your name we pray. Amen. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul the work is finished the end is written Jesus Christ my living hope who could imagine so great a mercy what heart could Boundless grace, the God of ages, step down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me his own. Savior, I'm yours forever, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Christ, my living hope.
came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Then came the Sealed the promise, your buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Jesus knows is the on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. Salvation in 